There's times when as a jazz guitar player, we are confronted with two bars or maybe four bars on the one chord. Now, it often happens at the start of a tune or sometimes just before the B section. Either way, if we follow the advice of playing chord tones or a scale to fit that one chord, then we run the risk of our lines being static and predictable. The greats use these places as an opportunity to bring the classic technique for creating interest for our listeners, that being tension and release. For me, it also gives their solos a sense of movement and forward momentum. When you're practicing playing over changes, if you just find you're just matching up arpeggios at the right time and you're hearing the same old predictable sounds, then stay tuned for these tips that I want to share with you today. Now, these are things I've learned from listening to records and transcribing. My first method relies upon one of the most common harmonic devices used by songwriters for dramatic effect, and that is the use of the minor four chord, where you replace the usual major four chord with a minor chord. We need a song to test this out with. Let's use There Is No Greater Love just before the B section. You get two bars of the one chord, B flat. Now the song is in B flat major. Chord four would normally be E flat major. So we're gonna use E flat minor in our line to create our tension and release. If we just played it in chords, it would sound like this. In arpeggio form, it would work like this. And here's a line which reflects B flat major, moving to E flat minor six, the minor four, and then back to that one chord, B flat. And a couple other ideas. Now just because we are using the minor four, it doesn't mean we have to use all the notes of that chord, of that E flat minor. Sometimes I like to just pick out the all important minor third. In this next example, I do just that. I also like to use this when playing sort of chord melody or, or solo bass guitar, or maybe accompanying someone else, depending on the context and what everyone else might be doing, um, or really whether they have an ear for these typical ways to embellish the changes. So I might do something like this more in sort of chord form. Method two gives you an easy way to play this situation by simply chromatically stepping away from the one chord. We again need a context, so let's take the first two bars of Girl from Ipanema, where we have two bars of F6-9. We're in the key of F, that's your one chord. Uh, a basic sound to choose over this would be an F major triad, so the one, three, five. Strong sounding notes, they can sound great, but maybe not too colorful, and it's easy to run out of steam with just the vanilla chord tones sometimes. So what I like to do is I like to take these simple triad shapes, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and I'll play a line with the home correct triad, so F major in this instance, and then I move up a semitone to an F sharp major triad, and then resolve back down to F major. It's like we're stepping outside and then popping right back inside. Now, here it is in an example using the A shape. It would also work with these other simple triad shapes too. So why does this work? Well you can make any notes played with conviction and good rhythm work I believe, but for me this works because the dissonance is, is quickly resolved. It's a much simpler way to bring in outside harmony than say something like the altered scale which is you know, quite a complex scale to get into your ears and under your fingers, certainly. And with this simple triad approach to go outside, you can just move your major triad or a minor triad, depending on what key you're in or chord you're playing over, up a semitone and then bring it back to the home position. Uh, the line now has a journey. Rather than just traveling along the same path, it starts here, it moves away from there and it returns. So it takes the listener somewhere and as a result, it's more interesting than just sticking with the plain old 135 of F. Method three invokes something jazz musicians do all the time, and that's borrow some ideas from the blues. And, and one way I like to do this is moving to dominant chords, and this gives our lines a nice bluesy quality, I think. So there's two I'd like to share with you. Um, one is moving to the four chord of the, of the one chord as a dominant, and then what's called the flat seven, or the, the backdoor dominant as it's often referred. So we need a context again, so let's take this pocket of all the things you are. Here we have two bars of C major or C major seven. 
So rather than just playing a line which is based around C major with either like your C major triad, a C major seven arpeggio or a C scale, what we're going to do is put in a movement to the four chord but as a dominant. Like a blues does really like, you know, the, if you played a blues in C, it's going to go C to F7. So we're going to do that here and you know the four chord of F is C, so I'm thinking of this movement C to F, but we're going to make it F7 so it sounds more bluesy. In chords it would sound like this. In a line it could sound something like this. Or in kind of a more arpeggio based fashion, so maybe it's easier for you to hear, like this. Now moving on to the flat 7 or backdoor dominant. This is a dominant chord that's built off the flat 7 of the 1 chord or, or target chord. Uh, so the flat 7 of a C is B flat. So it's backdoor dominant is B flat seven. An easier way to think of this is that the backdoor dominant sits a tone or two frets below the roots of the chord you're, you're on. And so in chords, it would sound something like this. In a line, it could sound something like this. Now you obviously have to be able to hear these things and then work on packaging them into, into phrases and lines. Now I think just playing them as chords first is really important. This helps you hear the sound of what you're going to place over the top in these kind of circumstances where you have say a couple of bars on the one chord. Now the next idea is a little different. Rather than creating a tension and release move on the chord, we're going to make a journey to the next chord before it arrives. So it is introducing other sounds on the one chord that you wouldn't necessarily expect, but it's anticipating the next chord. Now we might first off learn that arpeggios are to be played when to match the time of the chord. This causes us to play to the bar lines too much and then everything is very predictable in our lines. If you had two bars of the same chord, say like the start of Take the A Train where we have two bars of C6, if you followed the chords you might play an idea like this on the first four bars. <laughs> Everything is neatly packaged into the bars there. We are respecting the bar lines and the chords, but it, it doesn't have to be like this. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what I just played there. It just maybe doesn't always have to be that way. So one thing we can do is we can anticipate that next chord, that D7 flat five, in that second bar of C and start playing it a bit earlier. I feel like it gives the lines much more momentum and connection to the chords and rather than playing the chords we are playing the changes or the movements between them which is you know there's more interest there to be had. And you might just take one thing away from that which is the bar lines you don't have to think about them so rigidly you know they they exist on written down paper of course and in a real book but soloists don't always play like that. My final tip for today is another one regarding unwritten chords that soloists often play. Now we've looked at everything so far in relation to major bass tunes, so let's flip to minor. Let's take the last two chords of the first eight bars of Autumn Leaves, so where we have two bars of E minor here before it returns back to A minor 7 for the next A section. Now if I follow those chords I might do something like this. Now that idea nicely resolved on the E minor chord and it sounded fine, but if we were going back for another A section to A minor 7 there's a neat trick you can do here. One technique we can employ to create movement is to play the dominant 7th arpeggio of the next chord. So here we can play the dominant of A minor to lead us nicely back to that A minor. So rather than having E minor, E minor, A minor, we're going to have E minor, E7, A minor because E7 is the, the dominant of A minor. Now you might even find some rhythm players play this or follow the soloist when they hear them do it. And it's, it's one thing that's very, very commonly used. In lead terms, we could do something like this. So I've shown you five ideas today. Start with one and try and incorporate it into your playing and apply it to the songs that you know. Remember it works well with two bars or multiple bars of the same chord. 
Now, if you enjoy my content, then please check the description for a link to my Jazz Standard Bass Patreon page, where I go deeper into standards with monthly comping studies, arpeggio etudes, and beginner and intermediate solos for you to gain confidence at playing over changes and pick up things like I'm showing you today. Now, leave me any questions you might have regarding today's lesson. Be sure to hit that like button or a comment. If you're new here, please consider subscribing for jazz-based content every Wednesday. Until next time, you take care.